This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Hindsight is twenty twenty. That's the saying that the people live by, and it, it can be very true. When you look back on situations in life, sometimes the further back, uh, or the further separated you are from a situation, and looking back, the clearer it can be. Life and learning put a lot of things into, into perspective and teach you the errors of your ways in some cases. Sometimes just more experiences will show you that you were on the right path, that maybe the decisions you did make or you wanted to make but did not were in fact correct. Trying to examine a childhood that seems to be plagued with not only paranormal encounters, but also mental illness is a very complicated puzzle to rebuild. What was a result of the illness? What was a result of the paranormal? That's what one person is trying to piece together as they re-examine their childhood years. Take a listen. I grew up in a town pulled between country and city. Too many people and too few buildings. There were bad spots in town where I was never to go because the people there were not safe. They were desperate. The town was large enough to house our own historical museum, but small enough that it was only open for one hour on Tuesdays. Where the story begins, the large corporate chains had just begun moving in and choking out the family stores. Forests were being leveled in favor of houses. My house is not an old one. I was born with this house, and I've grown with it. It was new since I knew it and built on old farmland. It's a tiny piece of suburbia that is quickly overtaking the country's land, one of many signs of the growing population of city folk. My mother herself had come from Detroit, and my father, an immigrant from Quebec, together as city folk, They had chosen this island of modernity over the other, more rural-looking buildings and had brought it with vultures circling overhead. While childhood friends living in the ancient houses in the outskirts, their only neighbors being trees, many stories of their hauntings, I only have a few, but they are of note. I was five when our story begins. Like all girls at that age, I was obsessed with stuffed animals, namely a large Sesame Street Ernie toy, roughly a third of my size. It would talk if you pressed its hand, and I was enamored with it the previous week. Being a week older and wiser, however, I'd become disenchanted with it. It was left abandoned and with dead batteries at the back of the closet. I was a timid child, easily frightened and constantly hiding. Because of this, I was often plagued with nightmares. This night was no different. I woke wide-eyed and sweaty. My entire world seems to focus on the way the orange light of my nightlight reflected off of the bedsheets. The silence of the night was deafening. That was when the night was shattered by a mockery of any human sound. And while it was English, it said, I feel great, I feel great. It might have well have been heathen tongues being hurled at me. I feel great, I feel great is not exactly what you expect to hear from a disembodied voice. I ran down the hall, the mocking, almost human voice following me. While I remember being quiet about it, my mother told me I was screaming the entire time. And so I was. I remember crying after parents had awakened, watching my mother, my mother reaching to the shelf at the top of the closet and grabbing the Ernie doll limp in her hands. I feel great, I feel great. I don't remember what happened past that point. She threw the doll away, or else dismantled it. When I asked her why it kept talking without batteries, she told me the capacitors had held a charge, but it wasn't enough to make the voice work correctly. Satisfied with the answer, the Ernie doll was quickly forgotten until years later. Regardless, this quickly sets the tone for anything following If you don't know what it is, you confront it. In the case of the doll, this ended painlessly. It was thrown out or elsewise forgotten, and it provided no further troubles. 
The issue with this line of thought is that I proceeded to apply it to everything else as well. There was a large boa-like snake I didn't recognize in the yard. Instead of fearing it, I thought it was beautiful because of its yellow tail and yanked on it hard, only months later learning that the snake was a venomous copperhead. While out selling Girl Scout cookies, a large red-tailed hawk buzzed directly over my head and landed on the railing only a few feet from me. Instead of recognizing it as a raptor, a bird of prey, instead of seeing the inch-long claws and curved beak, I decided that it too was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen and tried to pet it. My bravery was only matched by my stupidity. The only thing that saved me from becoming Nile-fingered Alex on the latter instance is that my mother saw it for what it was and the frog marched me away. After that, my dog had begun getting ill. He was old and his body was failing him. He was the only dog I had in my life. I'm seven at the time and he's ten. To lose him was unthinkable, so I thought he had the simple flu. My mother recognized the gravity of the situation and took me aside one afternoon. She told me, what any parent would have said. The dog would not last much longer, and in a few weeks, he would die. I quickly became hysterical, crying and snorting into her sweater. Too warm, too cold, all at once. What followed was entirely inexplicable, and I can barely even describe it to you without sounding insane. There was a sudden feeling, perhaps two minutes into my crying, like someone had reached a hand into my head and touched my brain. There was a sudden calm, and all my own hysterical thoughts were muffled in a simple question posed in this calm invasion. How long do you want him to live? It did not take long to consider this question, and I answered automatically, two years. Two years, after all, was a mighty long time. It was nearly one-third of my entire lifespan, and only after I realized that this wasn't very long at all did I waffle to try and take back the thought. No, please, twelve, twelve years. Not just two, don't leave. By then, however, the feeling of something else had faded. I was once again alone in my mother's arms. When I was eight, only a few months before my ninth birthday, the dog stopped eating carrots. Two weeks after that, the carrots. It was peppers. Three weeks, and it was leftovers. After my birthday, he would accept nothing but his dog food, and that, too, he stopped eating. A normally fat dog became thin to the point of seeing ribs. His thick coat fell out in chunks. We went to the vet and they told us his liver was starting to fail. They could not pinpoint the cause of it, but they surely would be able to treat it soon. After his liver, it was his bladder, his stomach, his heart. Within several months, nearly every organ was failing. He was put down under the apple orchard by the vet's office. We went out for ice cream after, I remember, trying to recover a bit. Halfway through the dinner, the previous wish for my dog's life occurred to me. I realized that was two years ago. I was nine now. There was this pervasive sense of guilt after that. I was closer to that dog than was perhaps healthy for a child, and I felt like I was responsible for his death. There was a lull in anything happening here, to be frank. For several years, I was just an angry little kid that didn't care about anything, straight up until I was 11. I played far too much Warcraft than was healthy and looked down on the others my age with disdain, despite being exactly like them. It was at this age, then, that the OCD had begun to manifest itself once again. Something you must understand is that OCD is not a simple compulsion endearing in the eccentricity. OCD is not when one must organize books or fold their clothes a certain way out of mild annoyance. OCD is about fear and adrenaline. It's about superstition. You must look away every time someone uncaps their pen because it is a Freudian symbol of their penis and to look is to be a sinner. You must not make grammatical mistakes because mistakes means you are inferior and only sinners are inferior. You must wash your hands until they bleed because it shows penance for your sins. You must starve until your nails are as soft as cheese to show you are not worthy. That's OCD with a religious inference. True OCD has to its core a strong resemblance to paranoid schizophrenia, and to this day I do not understand why perfectly healthy people would ever want to lay claim to this disorder. The only true difference between schizophrenia and OCD, in my opinion, is that the OCD sufferer has a strong knowledge of how delusional they are and how stupid, but they can't stop even if they know, because if they did stop, they would die from the fear. This cycle began 
when I was 11. I was unlike my sister. I had virtually no compulsions to wash my hands or fast. What I did have were the cyclic thoughts. And these cut me to my core. God to me quickly became an eternally disappointed creature, something that looked upon me with mild distaste. He became a creature that would stand on the surface of the water and watch me drown with neither like nor dislike of my death and damnation. And even if he wanted to help me, he could not. So completely trapped in his own power was he that action or even inaction was beyond his grasp and he was forced to be a permanent, eternal observer of the world. I became obsessed with trying to impress this eternally disappointed deity, for if I didn't, Satan would find me. Living without fear of my God's abandonment of the Antichrist, middlemen became an alien idea to me, and even though I knew it was crazy, I was afraid. Every night became a sleepless one spent in the bathroom, either closer or further away from vomiting than the previous night. My mental illness indeed was making me physically ill as well. The night I would get sleep was rare, and the day my bones did not hurt was unheard of. When I did sleep, there was no release from the disorder and demons following me in my dreams. In the height of one such night terror, however, when I was running from whatever flock plagued me that day, the dream lapsed into the silence of something else. Any sound faded away to the hissing pulse in my ears, and all of my characters simply dropped in their tracks. My thinking was muffled and then stopped, and there was the same calm as the years before. There was nothing but the silence and the calm for a long time, and it seemed to stretch on indefinitely. The same feeling of a hand within my skull holding the mind began before this, and it had stayed there. Time itself seemed to have stopped. There was a moving shape in the distance of a dream, the only thing moving, and as it got closer, I saw it. It was a man, but not a man, dressed in black with a face that I could not see directly. I think it had eyes, and they were green, or perhaps blue or gray. Looking back, it moved with jerking, deliberateness, as if it only moved within keyframes of animation. But it seemed so natural, elegant to me at the time. It stopped in front of me and stood to stare, no more defined than it was before. There were no words in the silence, but somehow I diverted comfort from the stare. If it had spoken, the words would have been simple. I am here. And the image of a not-man went away, walking into the distant wall of the scenery and just disappearing. The silent calm, however, remained. The calm persevered into my waking life the following morning. Fear and compulsion had seemingly been completely eradicated, instead replaced with an odd alien presence within my own head, something that extruded a sense of being an elder, something old and formidable that demanded reverence. At the same time, it gave a sense of familiarity, as if I had known it or it had known me for far longer than it gave a hint to. I was convinced I had finally reached psychosis, but I didn't care even if I had. I was happier now, and what was life without happiness? Odd things began to happen after that day. I remember at least two occasions where dreaming I was being told a story by some sort of narrator with a forgotten voice. When I awoke hours after, trudging out into the kitchen for food, my mother would ask me if I had stayed up late watching Photoshop tutorials again. She had heard a voice in my room, she claimed, but it had sounded canned and unnatural, so she thought I was watching videos on the internet. Soon after, I would often wake up to find a vaguely humanoid shape of a shadow or perhaps smoke because it had formed, standing in the center of my room. At first, I was barely surprised by this, as if such occurrences were merely a fact of life. Then I began to record myself sleeping, hoping to catch whatever this was in action. The recordings upon review in the morning were always exactly one hour and 47 minutes of empty footage. I was never able to get a recording that lasted far enough into the night to be of any worth. There were a few isolated times that I remember where I was in the space between dreaming and awake with the buzzing silence that comes before a faint in the background, breaking behind the static. There was a lullaby being hummed. I'd wake up from these dreams to a shadow man in my bedroom, passively staring. I cannot tell you whether this was the presence or whether I was just dreaming. I can only tell you that it happened. Like all things, even now, I'm just saying to put all the pieces together to see if there was any 
theme or idea behind everything. I will not claim that whatever this was, that it was some sort of angel or ghost or demon. Even at the time, I did not believe it. So you must remember the clarity that OCD allows. And so I thought myself becoming unhinged from reality. I had many theories about this entity or delusion, and none of them included demons or angels. It described itself only as some sort of scavenger and would not go into detail much beyond that. The answer to what the presence was, besides the possibility of schizophrenia, however, has not made itself immediately clear to me. Slowly, I am now starting to recover one occurrence at a time from my childhood. My nightmares were far from normal. I can only describe one such dream as nothingness, which had the shape of a cube in a center. The nothing cube replicated on all sides. All the nothing cubes touched at every point in space and lay side by side. Their edges, despite having none because they were touching at every point, had space between them. At the same time, none of them existed, and all while giving the impression that they did. All in a nothing void that stretched out into affinity. It was one of the most horrifying moments I can remember. I was five at the time of that dream. Even fondly remembered memories as well, I'm discovering new depth to, for at least six years after I had tried to pet the bird. I'd remembered it was a red-tailed hawk, to the point that I remember it so clearly I feel as though I could touch it. I remember the rust-colored tail feathers and the warm brown of its wings and the way its eyes caught the light and threw it back at me. I remember how yellow and scary and scaly its feet were, and that they reminded me of ducks and that I like ducks. I told my mother of this memory perhaps a few months ago, and my mother gave me this dubious look like I had gone mad. It was a turkey vulture, she had said. I tried to argue at this point with her, but she was set that it was a turkey vulture, and it was much larger than a hawk would ever be. She didn't understand why or how I could confuse the two when I spent all my time in my room reading about birds. All I search for in the end are answers, and I've yet to find any. These are the memories I've recovered. I want to understand what happened and why. Even if they are only mildly bizarre, they may yet still have some meaning. Hopefully in the future, I'll remember more and get a clearer picture of what I went through. stories online. Want a commercial-free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories? Sign up at Apple Podcast right now and try it for three days free. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories.